Hey, Alphabet Boys listeners. I wanted to tell you about another podcast from Western Sound. It's called Lost Hills, and the third season premieres today. Host Dana Goodyear takes a deep dive into the surf world to explore the legacy of Malibu's dark prince, Mickey Dora. A surfer known for his style, grace, and aggression, Dora ruled Malibu from the 1950s to the 1970s. He was celebrated for his rebellious spirit. He was also a con man who led the FBI on a seven-year manhunt around the world. Take a listen to a clip from the show and then go and subscribe. You can find the Lost Hills podcast wherever you like to listen. Mickey Dora was a born con man. He could talk his way into anything and out of almost everything. His alleged scams ranged from petty and kind of ridiculous, like renting out surfboards that didn't belong to him, to blatantly criminal. Credit card fraud, fake plane tickets, stolen ski equipment, stolen antiques, stolen passports. Eventually, his schemes would land him in federal prison. You associated with him at your own risk. Denny Alberg has a story about this, the kind of thing that would happen on a typical day hanging out with Mickey. In the early 70s, Denny was invited to Kauai by a Hawaiian surfer named Joey Cabell. At the time, Mickey was also in Hawaii. Cabell told Denny he'd like to see Mickey, too. So I called up Mickey and told him, Joey invited you to come, and he came right over. He showed up. It was amazing. Cabell, who was in peak physical shape, proposed they hike to a beach to spend the night. It was an 11-mile hike, and not an easy one. So I'm trudging along with Mickey Dora on this uh, really tough hike, you know, for us. And we're like city slickers. (laughs) Dora had these leather boots on, really the wrong equipment, you know. And I was kind of feeling a little sick myself. And it got dark on us, and we're going through these canyons and pushing branches away. Mickey was tortured, you know. Finally, they arrived at the beach. They were exhausted, and Denny was starting to feel really bad. We passed out in some cave, you know, and woke up in the morning, and uh, Mickey could see that I was a little sick. So his mind started working like, I, I can't hike back. I gotta figure something out. And he saw this helicopter go by, you know, and it was a, they had a tours. So Mickey had an idea. Mickey slipped away and went down to the shoreline, where he gathered up some rocks and used them to write S.O.S. in big letters. The next thing I know, the helicopter lands on this pad down the beach, and Mickey goes up and talks to the guy. I don't know what he was saying, but apparently he was telling the guy, my friend's dying on the beach. I, I, we need help. And the guy said, I can't come back right now, but you know, as soon as I take these people. And right before dark, this guy came back. And Mickey says, come on, that's it, let's go. Oh, okay, we start start doing the 50-yard dash toward this helicopter down the beach. And Mickey says, slow down, you got to act a little sicker, you know. (laughs) We walk up to the helicopter pilot, and he kind of looks at me, and I was trying to act sicker, and he opens the door. He let me in to the helicopter, and Mickey starts to get in behind him, and the guy goes, oh, no, it's not you, it's just a sick guy, you know. You know, no, Mickey, Mickey pulls out this little bottle. He said, I'm having an asthma attack. I can't breathe. He, you know, my feet are bleeding. I, I can't walk. I, you know, he just started crying the guy. You could tell the guy wasn't buying it, but he let him in. So we got lifted off the uh, pad. It was the most beautiful, majestic thing. I mean, the serrated mountains, his colors, you know. And we're in this little bubble up in the sky, and Mickey turns. He says, our magic carpet ride. When the helicopter landed in town, there were news reporters and cameras everywhere. We thought someone, they were bringing the dead guy, you know. <laughs> we land, and all these people kind of crowd around me, you know. And as soon as I get out, and they go, where's the sick guy? <laughs> oh, that was me. And they're all disappointed, you know, and they leave. Well, Mickey was disappeared. He's nowhere around. He disappeared on me. He left me holding the bag. So he pulled this whole thing off. And I went through and got checked out. I did have some little dysentery thing. The cops had gone looking for Mickey, and they found him trying to rent a car at the airport, and they dragged him back, you know, and they were trying to interview the guy, and he's showing him all these fake IDs. And one said Chapin, and the other one said Dora. And he 
who are you? Are you Chapin or Dora? And he's, he's laughing. I'm Chapin Dora, you know. And uh, I don't know how it happened, but he got out of the whole thing, and I, I was the fall guy. To Mickey Dora, the highest value was freedom. And that, to him, meant doing whatever served him best in any situation. For Mickey, freedom took priority over any other moral or ethical consideration. And he would do or say almost anything to get what he wanted. In 1974, Mickey left Malibu and set out on an adventure that took him all over the world, searching for the perfect, empty wave. He didn't have the money to travel like this, but he did it anyway, using blank airline tickets that he filled out for whatever destination he wanted. Mickey had a whole bunch from a woman who worked at the Pan American office. This is Linda Kai, Mickey's girlfriend and accomplice for much of the 1970s. You could actually write your own tickets back in those days. They were paper tickets written on, and all you needed to know was the mileage. And um, he had all the paraphernalia to, to work it out. Now, I don't know who the girl was that gave him this stuff. He must have made it sweet, you know. You're, but you're flying on these sort of forged tickets. Everything was fake. They shopped and dined and stayed in nice hotels. All of it, according to Linda, on forged credit cards. And all while being tracked from surf spot to surf spot by baffled agents of the FBI and Interpol. Back in the day, credit cards were plastic, of course, but they didn't have the strips on the backs like they do now in the manuscript. They had numbers and dates. I was assigned to take a little razor blade and change some numbers. And we did. And um, make it good for another month. Mickey had a way of justifying all this theft and deception. Mickey described it once as, um, he says, I'm not a criminal. He says, I don't commit crimes. He says, I'm an outlaw. He says, and there's a difference. Did you buy it? Yes. I still do. One of the great accomplishments that Mickey set out and probably was successful at was never working a day in his life. That was his real goal, and he accomplished it. I don't know if he ever actually had a job. Jim Kempton used to be the editor of Surfer Magazine, and these days he runs the California Surf Museum. He knew Mickey pretty well in the 70s, when they were both living in a surf town in the south of France. In fact, Mickey crashed at his place a lot, used his shower and his kitchen. One day... Jim noticed his passport was missing. And then sitting on the beach, you know, maybe two weeks later, I see this South African guy, looks sort of like me, and there's my passport. Mickey sold it to him? I'm sure he did. I don't have, I mean, how would you ever prove that, right? Unless you arrested them both, which I was not going to do. In any event. (laughs) Did you ever say anything to Mickey about it? No. In the surf world, it was almost currency to be scammed by Mickey. You'd come away from the experience with a story to dine out on for years. Mickey's appeal was not in spite of his criminality, but because of it. There's a lot of people who love the outlaw, who love getting away with it. It's something that, for many people, is a great satisfaction uh, to them to see people be able to accomplish that. And Mickey, for a long time, was able to do that without payment. We tend to idolize our outlaws. Jesse James, Pretty Boy Floyd, you know, you hear those stories about them, you'd think that those guys were somehow, like, heroic. They were sociopathic killers, every one of them, you know, um, that murdered people in cold blood. And yeah, did they give to the poor? Yeah, they did. Mostly, though, to say, to, to make sure that they didn't tell the cops where they were. We definitely idolize are outlaws. That's just something that is, I think, baked into the American psyche. And it's very prominent in surf culture. Very few nice guys are as idolized as the bad boys are. And is Mickey Dora the most idolized of the bad boys? He's not only the most idolized of the bad boys, he's also the most bad guys of the bad guys. (laughs) 
The darkest parts of Mickey Dora, though, don't have anything to do with his hustles and his cons, or even with the more serious fraud for which he eventually served time. The darkest parts of Mickey have to do with his soul and the attitudes he harbored there, of exclusion, racism, and xenophobia, a pattern of hate that maps onto the white, white world of mainland surfing, where he was Malibu's superstar in his sunglasses with his Cheshire cat smile, showing all the little sociopaths how it was done. It's an amazing story. You'll love Lost Hills, The Dark Prince. Search for Lost Hills and follow all episodes wherever you get your podcasts.